I mean, you're hearing this story. And, uh, but do you see a role that the, the government can, can have, as uh, Joseph was saying, in terms of galvanising, in terms of facilitating this? Or is it something that you should be just doing anyway? I mean, this is something that you should do as Walmart and you don't need help, you go and do it anyway. Or is there, is there a broader alliance, as was being suggested, that can be formed? Yeah, quickly, the answer is yes and yes. But um, we are working, quite frankly, in ways we never worked before. Uh, we're working with governments not in the United States, but around the world, uh, but also, too, working with um, our key suppliers and also even our competition in um, areas around, I'll broadly use the word sustainability, but also now, too, in agriculture as well. And so uh, we have a network of um, uh, NGOs, of governments, um, of suppliers, of other retailers, uh, acad academics in many areas, thought leaders in many areas. Uh, Fourteen of these networks, one of them is around agriculture though. Uh, they're very large, some of them 800 people involved. Um, but we are working now um, on what are the best sciences, what are the things that we can work together to develop standards, to uh, develop best practices. And we're doing that um, uh, specifically in the large impact areas, of which obviously agriculture is one of those. And I'm um, happy to say that um, after today's uh, events that we had and, and this event that we're um, all in today, um, that I think we'll be accelerating um, our efforts around sustainability in agriculture. And certainly the efforts that we're doing um, are open source. Uh, anything that we learn in this area, we are sharing with everyone, including our competition and um, working with a number of universities and stakeholders now to get that information out and do more research around it. And yeah, no, very interesting, and I think, um, I mean, I'm going to deviate a fraction from uh, sort of pure food security to, to ask a question which is critical, obviously, to food security around issues to do with sustainability, to do with the environment, uh, to, to do with climate change. I mean, I, I heard you mention uh, sort of zero tillage and conservation farming earlier, and uh, I, I mean, the, the kinds of developments that this requires, you know, to, to broaden that, that out to include issues of climate change, uh, mitigation issues into farming and to, to look at conservation farming and that, does it also require a new kind of partnership? You know, do we need to be reaching out beyond just the traditional agriculture sector in this sense, to, to the environment sector and to other sectors? Uh, Gabrielle, I'm going to ask you... Uh, well, just, well uh, definitely. It uh, definitely requires, because um, telling you the, 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 the situation the, at the European Union, the European Union is now putting a lot of restrictions on the farmers in terms of uh, adopting um, practices which are more uh, environmentally friendly, and, but, and they are very strict on the uh, food safety. Um, at one point, when, we st when the European Union started with that, we were a bit worried because we didn't have the tools for that. Uh, so some farmers, we had to, to, to decide, do, you want to do we want to stay uh, in business or not? Yes, we do, so we have to solve the problem. Many of us went into the uh, conservation agricultural practices. Uh, with um, to the um, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, and um, simultaneously the European Union gave us a fund or a subsidy to go faster into these kind of uh, practices. The only thing is that at the same time they are giving us a funding, but they are forbidding us to do some things. They are uh, retiring from the market, many pesticides. So now we're finding uh, ourselves in a situation where we are asked to produce, but we don't have the tools or we have too much rest uh, restraint or constraints. That's why um, I particularly and some farmers, we tend to talk that um, the European Union, if, he, if he, uh, she wants, if it, it wants, to go towards a more sustainable agriculture, if they want us to increase no-till surface, if they want us to increase integrated pest management, is not enough to give us a fund 
or subsidy because many of the times it doesn't compensate for the loss you might have because you are implementing these practices. So one of the things, one of the ways we find we should uh, be um, able to do and the European Union should permit us to do were the biotech crops. Uh, you may know that we on, can only grow BT corn in Europe. There's an enormous uh, opposition to the biotech crops by missing, very uh, much misinformed people. The society trusts more the journalists than the scientists. Uh, and we're getting to a sort of narrow street where uh, if we don't have enough tools, we cannot be efficient producing and being sustainable at the same time. So, I mean, Robert, I mean, this, I mean, it's often, you know, you, uh, how do you respond to this in the sense, I think, for, like, for African farmers or farmers in Asia, this is even going to be more pressing as the impacts of climate change really take uh, effect. And this trade-off between food security and climate change, is there a trade-off? You know, do we need that? Uh, well, that that's a, a very per uh, pertinent question. Uh, before Al Gore's movie came out, An Inconvenient Truth, I used to talk about a convenient convergence uh, of this nexus of food security and climate change. And that is basically that uh, addressing, and I think one of our speakers this morning alluded to this, that when you address the, the challenges that, that smallholders, particularly rice uh, farmers, uh, are facing, drought, floods, uh, seawater intrusion, etc., cetera, uh, that are being becoming more of a concern because of climate change, you also address the needs that are directly affecting, or challenges that are directly, directly affecting farmers today. So I think it's not an either or kind of thing. And likewise, when you look at the, uh, uh, the challenge of, uh, challenges of greenhouse gas emissions and mitigating uh, the, uh, the impact of agriculture on, on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, managed properly, they're uh, economically, should be very uh, attractive to farmers economically. So I think that uh, by applying uh, ourselves and, and then looking at the challenges uh, from the perspectives, both of the farmers' needs today, the needs of the environment uh, tomorrow, and the challenges that will be uh, uh, facing farmers in the future, uh, we have an opportunity to, to develop uh, multiple win uh, solutions and multiple win scenarios. And I'm extremely sympathetic with the European farmer uh, who is, instead of being allowed to, to take the best of technology and, and, and aggressively uh, meet the demands of society, that same society is placing constraints on the farmers. And I hope that that, that doesn't happen uh, in developing countries. Let me just add a couple of things on, on some of these points. Um, first of all, I think we cannot allow our food security effort to be seen as a Trojan horse for ag biotech. I think that's, that's important. At the same time, I do think we've got to bring ag biotech to the forefront of the discussion. And not as a silver bullet, but as a way of, 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 of addressing climate issues, of addressing uh, hunger, and addressing some of the needs of some of the, the, the countries that have the most need. Um, well, one of the things that we're trying to do in the State Department is to partner with companies, to partner with government, and partner with regulators. And actually, I've had some success in a couple of the countries of trying to work with the regulators to create alliances, uh, to, to have them uh, come to the U.S., to have them uh, to engage in capacity building with a lot of our land grant universities, uh, to try and build some of the alliances, and basically to try and get the regulators comfortable with the technology. Part of what's going on here as I go around the world is a desire to look at the issue, but a real insecurity and an unwillingness to, to take that step that you as a regulator that creates a risk. So, so the, the need to, to build alliances and then also with regulators and also from a government point of view to try and, and work with industry to, to anticipate some of these problems. Some of these problems in, in, in biotech we know are coming, we know that, uh, but oftentimes uh, the people in our, in our bureau who are, who are supposed to deal with this issue just learn about it after the fact. At that point, it's too late. And so one of the things that we've got to get better at is anticipating roadblocks as well as building alliances. 
Yeah, I mean, I think as we see more volatility, you, you're going to see that, that need for more understanding risk and the complex nature of risk and, and the kinds of solutions and technologies and you know, the balance of that, that, that you have in terms of either transferring that risk, mitigating that risk, reducing that risk and you know, how that stuff. But uh, I mean, you know, Matt, from the, the private sector side, the, the, this whole uh, issue of trying to enhance food security, balance that with the, the growing you know, perceived needs of, uh, of climate change and the impact mitigation that's going to be required there, but also the adaptation and you know, how that's done. How, how do you deal with that from, from a company perspective? That's a large question. Um, a couple different things. I guess the one thing is... Yeah, you don't come to the World Food Prize and you know, get small, small questions. Small questions. <laughs> uh, that's a large one. But, you know, we look at it, and I guess, for a very holistic sense. Um, as the world's largest retailer, we want to grow our business. We want to serve more people. We want to sell more products to them. And so food security, um, assuring the supply, um, selling quality products at a, at a very economical price um, is core to our, um, our business sustainability. And so um, we are working in ways that we never worked before, developing um, uh, from literally from the farm up um, uh, products, um, increasing uh, heritage agriculture in the uh, United States, but also working abroad uh, in, in sourcing as a means of development so that we can have those products on our store shelves and provide those customers who do shop in our stores. So um, it is a very broad and very big issue, um, but you know, we, we oftentimes get stuck on unintended consequences of what some of the things we do ultimately cause. And I'd say the, the, one, um, the one real uh, benefit that we have had found as a company over the last several years is that we're starting to see what I'll call um, unintended benefits of what we are doing uh, in other areas. And we mentioned, or you mentioned greenhouse gases. Um, we made, um, well, I'll say not a simple change, but a, um, uh, a goal set to uh, only source or only use sustainably sourced palm oil in our prior brand products, products that uh, Walmart designs and works with manufacturers to create for us. That one small move is going to remove about 5 million metric tons of greenhouse gases permanently um, from the environment. Um, and so um, looking at the major impact areas, the major issues, uh, and doing what I'll call is relatively small things that have big impacts is what our focus is on. Uh, we can all work on the small things, and they will create momentum, they will create change. But I think the key is, is to really focus on a couple of the really big issues, work together collaboratively, which um, I think as a company we are doing, and then start making progress against some of the big things that we are trying as a um, global group of people here to make a difference around. And I think that's the key. Um, Can I ask though, I mean, well, you've got the microphone. Do you think, like, let's take palm oil. You know, it's a fairly challenging area. And I was with the Minister of Environment from Malaysia recently, and he was talking about the establishment of the round table uh, on sustainable palm oil, if that's the name that they use. And uh, what, what he was saying was, you know, before that, there weren't really the institutional resources at a country level to deal with these kinds of complex partnerships. That, that are being required, which which you know deal with smallholder farming issues, you know bring in uh, you know sort of climate change related issues and all of that, and so for them they've actually had to go through a whole learning curve to to create the kind of institutional frameworks. In this case, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, which is a merger between you know WWF and Oxfam and the companies and all of that, a very un, you know different kind of framework. So do you think there's a need for a new kind of type of uh, brokerage facilitation institution that will allow smallholder farmers to engage in these you know, big discussion topics that are going to impact on them significantly? And um, I'll ask you and then I'll pass this over yeah, maybe to... Uh... There very well be in the future. I think today uh, some of the groups you mentioned, and certainly WWF, uh, um, uh, their CEO, Carter Roberts, was actually um, in our meeting today 
um, and has helped us tremendously in, in giving us the information and, the, and educating us on what we can and cannot do. Um, so certainly, uh, I think over time, uh, and hopefully our signal, our statement, our commitment today around um, the sourcing of palm oil for our private brands that is sustainably sourced will create um, a larger demand, but also too then hopefully the equal supply and move um, more markets towards being harvested in that manner. But I think over time, you're gonna get beyond um, the capabilities of what's in place today. And so what the future holds, um, I'm not sure. But um, I think certainly um, by getting the, uh, the right direction started is something that we started today and I hope others do. And certainly um, I think the momentum is starting to build. Jose, what, I mean, from your side, do you see, I mean, I, I've seen this very much, you know, in terms of developing things like the Agricultural Growth Corridor in Tanzania and in Mozambique, that you, you know, the, the role or the non-existence or the existence of these kinds of new uh, facilitating brokering partnership platforms at a, at a country level have been critical, but they, they don't exist terribly much, you know, as such to date, and so we're having to rethink this a bit. Do you, do you share that, or is that, how do you see that? I share that, and I, I, in fact, one of the things that I think we need to do is to um, create some, to leverage uh, some of these institutions to try and work with them either on a regional basis or on a product basis. For example, um, uh, in East Africa, why can't we work, rather than asking our companies to work with specific countries individually, why can't we work with the East African community? On a, on a much more regional, much more general approach that's going to make it worth it for, uh, uh, for our companies and for companies around the world <clears throat> that may not particularly want to go into one, one country to work with them regionally. And that's, if you take that approach, you can do that uh, on, on the climate change side, you can do that on the, uh, on the regulatory side, you can do it in Central America, there are a number of places, but I do think we've got to ramp it up. Because if we, if we do it individually, um, maybe our grandchildren will see it and it'll, it'll, it'll take too long. Gabriella, I mean, do you think these, these you know, from where you were doing when you were trying to put this partnership together, say on sugar beet with Italian and Spanish you know, farmers coming in with their technologies, I mean, is the institutional framework there to support you to do this? Uh, well, um, for in this, the sugar beet um, experience, we didn't have any support. So the industry and the farmers paid for that. Uh, and we paid um, a Spanish institute to uh, give us all the, uh, the, the know-how and the, the varieties. Um, but in other um, sectors, like in the cereal sector and uh, in no-till, we um, have been able to uh, apply to some programs of the European Union and be supported for uh, some of the institutes who had done um, that research. Yes. Okay, I'm going to... Robert, you can come in if you want. Otherwise, I thought we've got about 10 or 12 minutes left. I'm sure there's a couple of questions out there. Uh, I've got a couple more. I'd like to find out more about cell phone technology and financing and some of this alternative expanding the partnership model even further, but I, I will hold my uh, thoughts and I will see if anyone, if you come to the microphone, which people already are, that's great, give your name, where you're from, and ask, keep your questions very concise or I will cut you off because we've only got the 10 minutes, so very short. Hello, Angela Wanicki, I work at General Mills, uh, originally, I'm Kenyan. I love that format is now in Africa because I know that you market to you know how to market to people of all socioeconomic status. So what is your vision for Africa? Because our farmers need a market. So what your vision for Africa? Well, um, I, I think you're commenting on um, our recent um, uh, initial movement to acquire a, a retailer named MassMart in Africa. That's not been uh, finalized yet. So I, I would obviously be a little premature in saying a plan that we have um, ready to roll out in, in, in that country. Um, but uh, suffice to say, um, having, um, as a company, spent a great deal of time in your country um, or in Africa, um, that it is a market that we are very interested in, that we see tremendous opportunity for growth, but also too from um, 
supplying products we, that we also sell in our stores globally. So um, hopefully if everything goes well, uh, time will tell. We'll be a, 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 a new um, corporation in Africa shortly. Okay, uh, this is, I'm Patrick Benz from uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, my question is particularly to Matt Kistler. Uh, a, an important element of sustainability is the social equity component in which the smallholder farmer in this case has some greater participation in the value added of their product. Uh, sometimes this is seen as fair trade product, but generally the idea is that the producer of the agricultural product gets somewhat greater return for their effort. When you have large market power forces in the purchasing side, it's very difficult to come to an equation where there is greater equity at the producer level. What is Walmart's thinking about how to incorporate more of a fair trade, a more social equity participation for the smallholder farmer in agricultural products that you sell? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I think there are two parts to that question, so I'll try to address both, um, and hopefully that takes care of it. Um, number one is we are the world's largest purchaser of fair trade product, um, whether it be bananas, coffee, roses, um, we are a very large purchaser of all those goods. Um, personally, I've been to Brazil, I've seen the efforts that Fairtrade has done with the coffee growers uh, in Brazil and elsewhere, and we continue to do that. And we are also uh, marketing that product to our customer. And um, hopefully, um, if any of you do shop at Walmart, you'll see those products on the shelf and uh, you can help um, move us all in that direction because certainly um, I'm, a big, I'm a big supporter of it. Um, work very closely with Transfair and uh, Paul Rice and others, and uh, uh, it's certainly a market that we see growing, um, not only domestically, but also globally. Um, with regard to um, uh, farmers globally, uh, we are working um, in all the markets that we're in to increase our direct relationships with farmers, and by doing so, actually increasing their income in developing countries by 10 to 15 percent because we are working directly with them versus going through cooperatives or other uh, middle people uh, in the uh, supply chain. And so um, not only does it um, make our business more sustainable, but I also too, from the customer standpoint, we're delivering much fresher, much higher quality product to them and doing it in a more environmental and um, obviously socially sustainable manner. So uh, two big initiatives that um, uh, we are very supportive of, see tremendous opportunity in, and are developing um, as fast as we possibly can. So my question is to Director General of uh, International Rice Research Institute. I am Ravi Chandran, farmer from India, Tamil Nadu. Uh, the success story of uh, IR8 is still uh, vivid in our memory. The ADT 2027, developed by Audrey with the support of uh, Gary, that uh, uh, made tremendous impact on our uh, economic performance. Uh, even now, IR20 and IR50 are still popular. See, in the lunch on session, uh, the CEO of uh, the Chief Executive Officer, uh, Melinda Gates and Gates Foundation, Mr. Jeff, uh, pointed out about the uh, blood tolerant variety. Uh, in fact, he displayed a slide also. Uh, it is very amazing. Uh, my place is uh, blood prone area. Uh, what is the uh, research work on GM rice in Iri? Uh, so we have a variety of problems like uh, biotic and abiotic stress. Uh, we have, uh, we need uh, saline tolerant variety, blood tolerant variety, drought tolerant variety, and other uh, biotic uh, pest disease and uh, weed problem, all such things we need. Is there any research work going on in uh, Iri? Yes, uh, in a word, yes. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit of activity in precisely the areas you, you outlined. Uh, the vast majority of that work uses tools of biotechnology, particularly marker-assisted selection. Uh, very little of it, if any, is involving the use of transgenic or GMOs. Uh, we are moving these materials uh, uh, with our partners uh, across Asia, in particular uh, in, in South Asia and India. Uh, through various state governments, universities, and we are seeing them actually move into farmers' fields. Uh, 
in, in Tamil Nadu, looking at the uh, partnership with the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University. Uh, we expect to have these materials moving out and benefiting your, yourself and your colleagues in the, in the rice fields over the next uh, uh, several years. What is the state of the Golden Rice Project? Uh, golden Rice is, uh, is in its uh, final stages. Uh, as we speak, it is being uh, field tested. Uh, we have transferred the uh, pro vitamin A beta carotene uh, capacity to the background of varieties that uh, farmers uh, know and like, for example, IR64, uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, that's grown by many farmers in India, uh, equally popular varieties in Bangladesh, Vietnam, and the Philippines. So, up the back, just one more question. Thank you. I'm just moving through. You can grab him, and, you know, as he steps off the stage to take that a bit further. Yeah. Paul Castle from the Syngenta Foundation. I'm afraid it's another Walmart question. Um, fair trade always suggests to me that everything else on the shelf is unfair trade. And it'd be nice in the markets where you have enormous power to influence consumer thinking if we got away from that idea that there's fair trade and something else. And I'd be interested to hear um, your views on getting together with your competitors and helping consumers getting away from the idea that everything's got to be cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Because that, I suspect, is not good news for the small and medium-sized uh, farms that you now want to buy more from. Congratulations on that. I'd like your thoughts on getting consumers away from the low, low price idea and getting more of that, building on that previous question, back to whatever you mean by small and medium farmers. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Yeah, it's, it's a definition that varies greatly by market and um, certainly what we have here as a small medium sized farmer in the United States is different than it is in, in most countries. But to answer your question, um, you know, it's, um, we serve a variety of customer and our core customer uh, in the United States um, and I'll speak of that, I can also speak globally, but in the United States, is a customer who um, earns about $50,000 a year. And in today's economic situation, um, it is um, amazing to me the, the purchasing behavior we see, uh, paycheck cycles and purchasing food at midnight because that is when the cash um, hits uh, their bank accounts. And so while it, um, it would be in some ways um, great to have um, uh, fair trade product, uh, universal, and not have to market that product. Um, we need a variety of products on our shelves that um, allow um, everybody to eat um, and provide for their families. And so we provide that um, large portfolio of products, um, whether it be fair trade, uh, whether it be organic, whether it be Rainforest Alliance, um, that are available to the core customer for them to make the decision. Um, I'm happy to say that um, we see pickup of these more socially responsible products all the time, but to move um, all of our offering to them, quite frankly, would be um, financially not uh, the right thing to do, um, but also, too, would not provide for our core customer who today is struggling in the United States. And so um, we are working to make all of our products have the same benefits that some of the products that uh, we all speak of um, favorably uh, to move in that direction. But today, uh, the, the, the overarching economic um, um, system just won't allow us to do that yet. But if it can, uh, we certainly are um, wanting to move in that more socially, more environmentally responsibly way, and we'll market them accordingly. Okay, very quick last question because I'm being waved uh, at uh, here up the front. Uh. Yeah, my name is Elissa and I'm with Oxfam Action Corps. And I think that this has been a useful discussion of the collaboration between the institutions. But smallholders are the ones experiencing problems firsthand. And it would seem that their voices have to travel so far to reach you or people like you. And I'm uh, curious to know what specifically you're doing. Um, to bridge this gap and to ensure that voices are heard, given the power they deserve, and also included in working towards solutions. Uh, was that to Walmart or was that just general to the panel? Yeah, you know, to the panel. Um, well, we have a large group of stakeholders. Can I, can I just say, because you know, we've got two minutes, on, so if we can, maybe, I think it's a very important question, this one, as to how are we reaching out to smallholders. If I could just ask you to just quickly uh, you know, making sure that 